Hvala, ne znam na kom jeziku da nastavim. Možda prvo sam da kažem hvala što ste me pozvali i drago mi je da vidim toliko dragi ljudi tu danas. I da se izvinjavam da ću govoriti ovo na engleskom. Meni je lakše, ali možemo i miješati tokom diskusije. So, thanks once again. I suppose there might be a few people here who don't speak English. This year, yes, yes. So, <laughs> it's good that I'll be speaking in English. Um, so once again, thank you for inviting me and it's really nice to see people here and I hope that there are also people who came here because of the topic and not just because I know you, so I'm really <laughs> glad to see you. Um, okay, uh, let me get this up. I need my glasses. Um, here we go. Okay, so um, as Adriana said, what I'm going to do today is a bit of sort of um, transition from, I'm going to talk a little bit about my older work um, because, and, and then sort of transition into um, thinking about the so-called migration crisis of the last couple of years and the Balkan route um, and the discourses around it. Um, because what I, it's, probably a sort of just my own deformation of seeing, seeing things through my older work, but um, what I want to try to show is um, how some of the theoretical frameworks and analytical frameworks that I used in my older work um, are really showing up um, and are still very, very dominant in the current, um, in these current processes. Um, but I also want to think a little bit about how they're changing and, and how to, to move forward with um, with thinking about the, the events in this region. And the region is now kind of expanding to include Hungary because that's where I've been during um, most of this time, um, but also because it offers a lot of, um, let's say, rich examples of, of the kind of things that I'm, I want to talk about. Um, okay, so how do I do this? So starting with the older work, um, this was uh, ethnographic work with women's activists in post-war Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, which resulted in, among other things, this book. Um, and I want to just talk about some of, the, some of the main points that come out of it that I, that I find really um, relevant and useful um, still now. And one of the main things is, is um, breaking down um, discourses of victimhood and especially national victimhood um, because I was working from a position of Bosniak and Bosnian politics um, that of course all nationalisms as Blitz has told us um, all nationalisms <laughs> there was a Blitz article on my my uh, the same another version of this talk that I gave in Novi Sad on Friday um, where they put the the uh, the headline was about this this very point, which is actually just background, which is that all nationalisms are, are compete for, um, you know, sort of being who's the vi biggest victim, right? Um, and victimhood is a very, very strong part of, of all of these um, nationalist projects. Um, but what I did was I sort of broke down victimhood and talked about how um, what is important in a, a, a narrative of victimhood is an absolute morally pure stance which is um, not implicated in anything that has to do with uh, political um, machinations, with uh, politics, with uh, war and nationalism. And this is what positioned women and women's activists um, in such a good place because they get um, constructed as outside of those realms, put them in such a good uh, place to be kind of iconic of victimhood, of national victimhood. Um, and then I'll go through some of these, these sort of frameworks that I find useful even now. One is the dominant uh, conception of war and nation, the construct of war, violence, politics, and national leadership as male realms, um, and then how women become to be taken for granted as, um, as victims, as unimplicated and innocent um, victims. What I looked at in this older work is how these women activists used, used these essentialist res representations of women as peaceful, as, as, um, uh, as non-political, how they used them uh, strategically in many, in many cases. 
And the, the emphasis was always on distancing themselves from war, violence, corrupt politics, etc. Um, which on the flip side meant that men are always held to be responsible, men as a group, political and military activist, actors and um, not seen as victims as, as men as a group. They might be individual groups of men that are seen this way. But um, So with gender and war, as I said, men get positive as the active, um, the actors of the nation, the fighters, um, those uh, who, whose job it is to defend. Women become passive victims, those to be defended. This is, of course, not what reality looks like, but these are the kind of assumptions of, um, of these roles that um, reinstate themselves over and over. Men of fighting age get constructed as legit legitimate targets in war, and women, uh, along with children, as innocent victims, as unimplicated. They can't be political beings. And then, similarly, with these um, patterns of gender and nation, um, we have a nationalist logic that is built on heteropatriarchal assumptions about women's and men's roles. Men get posited as the actors of consequence. Women are assigned symbolic and reproductive roles. Um, you have this nation as the male actor um, where territory gets feminized and posited as um, land or woman to be, to be protected with rape and conquest as, as the ultimate sort of symbolic defeat. This should all be fairly familiar, um, I suppose, to you. Um, but I want to go through some of these iconic um, uh, images that I analyzed in my old, older work. Good. Um, I don't know what <laughs> how to interpret that. Um, so one of, the, some, one of the, uh, the, the main sort of iconic images of, of Bosniak and Bosnian, and there's a difference, I can talk a bit more about that if necessary, but um, uh, Bosniak and Bosnian nationalist, um, national discourses, um, the, I, really the iconic images were women of Srebrenica. Um, they are often posited as mourning and pictured as mourning, uh, mourning their lost um, male relatives. And it's important that these are male relatives. They're their fathers and brothers and sons um, that they are mourning. They're, 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 not, they're not called the survivors of Srebrenica, the families of Srebrenica, but the women of Srebrenica, the wives and mothers of Srebrenica, um, because these fam familiar roles are very important. Um, in terms of the politics of, of victimhood, it's, it's very, it was very important to put emphasis on um, the, the, lost, the, the murdered men as uh, having been family members and not having been soldiers or even potential fighters. Um, because going back to this, um, men as legitimate targets um, and also potential fighters um, scheme. These women are also shown as protesting, but they, they protest within symbols of domesticity. Of These are pillowcases that they've embroidered the names of their missing onto. Um, they protest as mothers, as wives. Um, another uh, major, um, one of the other made, uh, sort of dominant images of female victimhood from, from, this, from that war um, are women survivors of wartime rape. But as I argue in the book, there, there's a sort of a certain ambivalence and discomfort around um, such women when they appear as individuals. There's always a, a, sh a cloud of suspicion or, um, and that suspicion has to do with whether or not they really, really, um, really could have escaped their fate or really um, they didn't do anything to have, have um, put themselves in this position. Um, and it's a classic suspicion that goes with uh, rape survivors in, in many contexts, as feminist critics um, have established very well. Um, men were also uh, images of this victimhood, this national victimhood. But um, here you have uh, men behind barbed wire in uh, concentration camps, more as a, a kind of echo of Holocaust imagery um, 
they're never sexualized, um, even though there were male victims of sexual violence. Um, so you have a, a kind of uh, imagery of, of moral purity, motherhood, of, of national purity. Um, religion becomes very, very central and important. Um, and in this, this book, which is a collection of, of testimonies of, of uh, war rape survivors, um, there are many essays, including one which really, really um, focuses on the role of men and, and focuses on the, 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 the deviant masculinity of the enemy, having, you know, in this case, Serbs and also Croats, um, being capable of, of committing these crimes um, because of a, of a deviant national essence um, in masculinity there, but they also, um, this, um, it, takes, it takes the position, um, an assumed position of a, of a male actor and calls on uh, Bosniak males to, um, to be ready to protect our women um, the next time around. Um, so it very much falls into this scheme of gendered nationalism that was uh, a really uh, prominent, um, prominent mode of critique in especially the 90s um, among feminists who, who analyzed um, the war violence and the politics around um, nationalist movements in former Yugoslavia, including in, in Serbia and Croatia. Um, and I'll come back to this um, soon. There's another aspect of this that I analyzed in my work. Um, which is the film that Angelina Jolie made about wartime rape in Bosnia and the controversy that, um, that broke out over the filming of it during, during the time when it was being filmed. Um, there were a group of rape survivors in Bosnia who objected to what they had heard was the plot of the film. Um, the actual plot of the film doesn't, doesn't differ so much from what they uh, were worried about. Um, they were worried that it was a story of a Muslim woman and who falls in love with her Serb rapist. Um, but what I argue is that the, the film does offer enough kind of ambiguity in terms of the agency of this character who is kind of symbolic of, of the Bosniak nation and, and sort of Bosniak victimhood in the film um, to cause enough unease to these uh, rape, rape survivors. Um, because even the suggestion of any sort of initiative, the fact that she might have a relationship um, or have some feelings for this for this um, this guard, although it's all, you know, just that suggestion is enough to tarnish the 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 pure um, reputation or the the pure image of victimhood. Um, and this is what I argue she was these. Um, especially this spokeswoman, but these uh, rape survivors were really objecting to and, and, and reacting to in this controversy. Okay, so now I want to go to talking about um, the migrant crisis, so-called crisis, maybe a crisis for EU countries, um, which started in the summer of 2015 um, and as you know, involved um, many, well, Serbia, Macedonia, Greece, um, coming up the, the, the Balkan route. Um, and then from September 15th of that year, when Hungary uh, closed its border and built a fence, um, rerouted uh, the Balkan route through Croatia and Slovenia into Austria and Germany, which was the, mainly their final um, destination. Um, and so this should be also be very familiar that um, the discourses around the pe these people on the move really revolved around people either being refugees or economic migrants. Um, there was a, always a distinction being made between whether they were legitimate uh, asylum seekers or uh, fleeing economic distress um, and wanting to come to to more prosperous countries and sponge off the, the welfare system, basically. Um, but I want to go back to some uh, 
so Lisa Malky, an anthropologist who wrote um, now quite a while ago about uh, refugees as being pictured as these um, brown-skinned masses, they're, they're um, helpless, passive, in need of a Western aid, they're, they're faceless, they're, she called them speechless emissaries. So their image was, was something that was used to, to drum up sympathy, right? But they, um, they're never, they're never uh, portrayed as having any sort of initiative, agency, um, uh, individual calculations um, when they think about it their lives, um, and they're seen as, as uh, third world, um, feminized women and children sitting in camps, right? Um, and then Heinemann and Giles uh, have also um, added to this, well, making a distinction between um, the kind of feminized masses that are um, you know, in camps and uh, subject to aid regimes versus when um, refugees, migrants um, start to move and they're on the move and then they become um, subject to a more masculinist security paradigms and in need, in need of control by states. And here's, I think, um, part of what uh, is, are the associations that, trigger, that triggered people's reactions to um, this migration move. Um, so what I'm seeing um, is a, a kind of reinvigoration of the old symbolic geography um, framework that um, we know from our, some of our audience members, <laughs> um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but also, so I put this up, um, which is an old Dani cover from um, uh, 2000 in, in Bosnia. Um, where it's not only this positing of East and West as, as essential um, binaries, the civilized and barbaric and um, all of the, the associations that go with that, but these are also very gendered binaries. The West is posited as, as um, gender equal and tolerant to LGBT people. Um, and there's also a racial aspect to it. There's a, uh, Europeanness is posited as in, in contrast to non-whites or less white um, uh, others. And so, in, in terms of, of the theoretical background, this is obviously um, Maria Todorova with Balkanism. Um, and the way in which this is, is gendered too, you have the reappearance of, of the tropes of Balkan, Balkan males, a kind of shady and, and untrustworthy um, in the form of the smuggler, which I will get to in a second. Um, and then we see them nesting and um, going back to Baki um concept, but uh, seeing them nesting and shifting and, and seeing people mobilize them in different, different contexts and shifting those borders um, to suit um, the, the goals that, that they're trying to, to reach in a, or, or arguments that are trying to be made um, in these discourses at different times. Um, I also want to point out these shifts in Orientalist depictions because, of course, these are mostly seen as, as Middle Eastern uh, migrants, um, as Muslims. Um, so we got a lot of, of depictions that, that drew on Orientalist stereotypes. Um, and in my older work, I, I drew on uh, an article by McMaster and Lewis, which points to what they called hypervailing as a sort of, it's a, it's a shift from what Said described as the sort of erotic, uh, um, sexualized uh, depictions of harems in, in the Orient um, and this shift now to hypervailing and, and, and uh, all-encompassing veils, niqabs, face veils, burkas being now symbols of, of threat, of terror, of, of um, threat to the West. There's nothing sexualized about them anymore. Um, Okay, and then we also have um, 
various uh, scholars articulating um, these processes like homo nationalism, which Jasper Poir has, has talked about in the, uh, in the context of US imperialism and trying to, in justifying um, uh, intervention in especially um, Iraq and the war on terror. Um, but positing the West as a place of tolerance for LGBT people, for um, gay rights. And uh, many people have used this to talk about um, places in Western Europe as well. Um, and there have been several incidents where, uh, as well as um, uh, in Israel in terms of pinkwashing, um, contrasting Israeli society to um, patriarchal, homophobic, Palestinian society. And then you have similar and, and I think much, much longer standing um, uh, phenomenon, which Ferris has recently called feminationalism, um, but which evokes Spivak's saving brown women from brown men, um, the, the kind of trope that posits the West as more gender equal, um, where women are emancipated, where um, it's a, it's a contrast to the, the patriarchal and the um, cultures oppressive to women um, found in the Orient. But not just in Oriental societies, there's also a nesting quality to that, which, um, so you have different degrees where Central and Eastern Europe or the Balkans um, fall somewhere in between. Um, and what I've, what, what I, I'm trying to think about um, is how these how how these more recent developments really resemble uh, the older um, critiques of gendered nationalism that I was talking about a, a bit ago um, in in, contra in uh, connection to my older work um, in terms of these patterns of of uh, positing the the nation as male, um, the, having the imperative to protect our women, um, but these have these kind of, of uh, trends are now. I'm seeing them being analyzed much more as populism, as far-right extremism, as anti-immigration politics, much more than talking about them as nationalism and especially as gendered nationalism. Um, Sarah Ferris has has. Um, her recent book um, on femo nationalism has has argued that we need to bring back um, nationalism and a kind of uh, post colonial through a post colonial lens um, to look at the ways in which um, nationalist discourses get gendered and sexualized um, so I want to to do that for this for this region specifically um, and then I also want to bring in um, considerations of race. We have, going back to Veren uh, Stolke and others who have been drawing attention to a kind of new forms of racism that, that get um, couched as, as um, discourses about culture, cultural difference and religious dis difference instead of uh, racialized difference, but that, that mask a, a racialization of other groups, such as Muslim immigrants um, and the, the migrants from the last couple of years. Um, OK. So here again, we are getting Europe equated with the EU. The Balkans become this kind of um, not quite Europe uh, and uh, ambiguous zone. Um, I think it's interesting, interesting to think about what's happening to Poles or other, other people from, from Eastern Europe, Hungarians as well, who are getting racialized when they go um, to work in the UK. Um, they're not seen as, as fully European. Um, and a friend of mine was telling, telling me a story about going back to her, her little country church um, in Wales where her family goes to church and hearing lots of anxiety about um, the threat of Polish men attacking local women. Um, and it was a very, uh, very familiar discourse, right? Um, and so obviously these, these, uh, these otherings and, and um, racializations are, are contextual. Um, 
and, and even when they really resemble the kind of other, othering of ethnic groups and ethnic difference that we find um, in this part of the world, I think we have to, to think about these racialization discourses on a kind of continuum and, 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 and behaving in, in very similar ways with um, those about ethnic difference. I already mentioned the figure of the Balkan smuggler. I have a, a student right now doing a thesis where um, on uh, the, the discourses and, and policy changes in Austria towards um, migration. And there was, she, she documents a, a clear pattern, especially in the beginning, before Austria closed its own borders. Um, especially in the beginning, there's a, a clear pattern of trying to to draw that border of the east and the problematic um, areas of, of smugglers and, and migrants away from Austria, right? So the, there was an incident where 71 migrants were found dead in a, in a truck just in, on, the, on the highway between Vienna and Budapest, but in Austria. And there was an insistence that these people had already been dead when they entered Austria. There was an identification of the smugglers as having Balkan con context or Balkan roots. They came from Hungary, they came from Bulgaria, and further afield in the, in the Middle East. Um, and there was also, and she, she also documents a kind of, of a, an image of masculinity that, that recalls all of this, uh, the, the older Balkan, Balkan masculinity tropes. Um, not the happy-go-lucky peasant one, but the sinister um, war criminal, criminal um, corrupt figures who are oppressive of women and who commit violence against women, of course. Um, Balkan women have been much less visible, but there have been um, stories about how women have been leading the solidarity movements and help and aid for refugees. Um, which also fits back into that women for women being for peace. Um, it might be true that that many more women were were involved in these in these efforts, um, but it's not telling the same, the whole story. Um, okay. So just to refresh your memory of what was going on, um, we have those who were trying to show, especially. Um, people around uh, the Hungarian government, but um, people in, in Western Europe as well, trying to argue against uh, Merkel's policy of opening the borders, um, and various groups trying to say, you know, we welcome refugees. Instead, they're trying to show uh, the migrants as never using the word refugees, always talking about them as migrants, throwing, showing them as single men, as threats, as terrorists, this is uh, from the September 15th um, incident when the Hungarians closed the border at Roske. Um, and a lot, is, a lot was made of these, these pictures. Um, but the point is that they are always single men and they are looking threatening. Um, so you have, you know, uh, single men especially, but also when they show um, the trappings of modernity, the trappings of you know the the, um, the usual expected behavior for a neoliberal subject, being a consumer, having a smartphone, um, making decisions. This is another thing that sort of discredits uh, the the migrants as refugees. They're called refugees when they pull out the selfie stick. You know you've been had, right? They've they're tricking us. They can't possibly be legitimate asylum seekers because they have cell phones, because they're taking selfies, um, because they're obviously connected to, by the way, families. They're embedded in family structures, um, even as, as they are traveling as, as men alone. Um, and then you have you know, these kind of, I treat these memes as just, you know, I'm not interested in who made them, but um, how they circulate and what the kind of, uh, points that people are trying to make about them. Um, so, you know, look, more widows and orphans, ha, ha, ha. They're single men. They can't possibly be, remember back to Lisa Malky's speechless emissaries, the mass of speechless, helpless women and children, um, which is the proper um, image of a refugee. 
So you had a lot of uh, things going around trying to show that you know the same man who's now a migrant today um, was in a militia in Syria or um, was in a, an Islamic terrorist group. Um, if you think about the position of a man of fighting age in a war zone like Syria, however, um, it's pretty likely that either they get conscripted into a militia that they are uh, expected to, forced to fight, or that um, uh, checkpoints pose a, a great danger of being um, killed or conscripted into a militia or accused of being um, an enemy, a member of an enemy militia. There are lots of those kind of very gendered dangers that are different for men than women, which might cause them want to want to flee that area too. And of course, um, New Year's 2015-16 in Cologne. Um, so they're showing, uh, oh look, all of these people are welcoming refugees. And then on the night of New Year's Eve, all of these women were attacked. Um, and the assumption is that these were all asylum seekers, refugees, um, immigrants. There's an obvious uh, racialization going, you know, wake, wake up, finally, um, wake up already, uh, is the caption. So you have this um, emphasis on deviant sexuality and, uh, of, and the sexual threat of a racialized other, which we've seen in many, uh, many other uh, contexts. Um, and interestingly, feminists were, were divided here. There were feminists who, who really um, wanted to curtail the migrants because they saw them as, as, um, as sexually threatening and, and uh, oppressive. Um, but then there were others who also tried to call attention to the lack of attention to violence against women in sort of everyday, you know, white Germans um, committing violence against women that was uh, being ignored. Um, And then we have Poland. Um, I don't know, <laughs> maybe you saw this uh, magazine cover. Um, this is anyway a kind of right-wing magazine that puts out lots of um, uh, fairly Islamophobic and, and racist and misogynist um, texts. Anyway, um, they staged this photo shoot with lots of dark-haired men attacking what is, um, obviously a white, blonde woman, right? So here, we, again, you have woman as the, sim the symbol of the land, of, of culture, of, it's not nation here, it's Europe. Um, but she's wrapped in the flag, it's, uh, you can't get more obvious, right, with the symbol. Um, she kind of reminded me of, of another image I, I um, analyzed long ago. Um, it's almost like it's the same woman. <laughs> um, <laughs> When Donnie used, uh, you know, this model to, to kind of celebrate the, the decision on the const constitutive nations um, in the political structure of Bosnia. Um, but again, she's got the flag. Is it Europe? Is it Bosnia on her? Um, it's both. Uh, and now Bosnia can finally stride into the future confidently, right? But again, nation as woman or territory as woman. So again, and, and you again have this contrast between women and children as refugees, so this war refugees then and today, um, with um, it's, it's immediately discrediting to any um, claim to, to legitimacy as asylum seekers that these are young men, they're um, single, they're using smartphones, and of course, they're lay, lying back in what looks like a lounge chair so that um, the, the contrast is supposed to get you and say, aha, they cannot be legitimate. But gender is a major part of this contrast. Um, that, that people don't, that, that just sort of goes without saying. Um, they're men, they can't be um, legitimate asylum seekers. Um, Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, talked about them looking like an army. Um, and then there, uh, this um, advertising campaign that they did in, in Hungary before this referendum that they, they wanted to, um, to hold in order to justify um, their anti, 
migration policies, um, there were signs like, did you know that the Paris assassinations were committed by immigrants? Did you know the number of uh, the level, I should change that, bad translation. Harassment against women has been dynamically growing in Europe since the immigra Im immigrant crisis. And there were other posters, but they're all connecting uh, migration to terrorism, to attacks on women, um, and trying to, trying to drum up support. Of course, uh, the referendum was not valid because not enough people came, but Orban still um, claimed victory because 98 or something percent of the people who did vote voted with the government. Um, and then just last week, we have Viktor Orban sponsoring and um, giving a speech at the Budapest Family Summit, which was a gathering of right-wing um, anti-abortion, anti-LGBT rights um, organizations that are transnationally connected. Um, they're connected to Russia. They've been lobbying, um, a lobbying force behind uh, anti-gay laws in Russia, in Uganda, in Ghana, and various places. Um, and the Orban government sponsored them and gave them a big welcome. And they were then, Hungary was praised for being a family-friendly nation. The, um, the slogan, as you can see, building family-friendly nations, making families great again, was the, the, the slogan of this. Um, so I just pulled out this one quote by the, the the spokesperson, Zoltan Kovac, a CEU graduate, by the way. Um, we believe that families and having kids is the key to the crisis of demographics we face, and that this is the, and that is the declining population. The philosophy goes against another philosophy, which is that the problems of Europe should be sorted out by migration, especially third country and non-European migration. So they're making a very distinct. Um, distinction between these choices and saying, you know, we don't want migration, especially of third country, third world, uh, non-European migration um, of people that, that, that um, Hungarian officials have repeatedly described as being culturally um, alien, as not assimilable. Um, of course, most of those migrants had no desire to stay in Hungary whatsoever. Um, partly because of the, the, um, the politics and of, of the government. Um, so they're making a distinction between those, between migration as a way to bolster the population, um, the aging population, um, and births. And so instead, new um, incentives were introduced for Hungarian women to have more babies, to increase the birth rate to the, um, replacement level um, in a really, in, in, a, in a, well, much faster than, in, than anyone believes it's possible. Um, and they claim that these women actually do want to have lots of uh, more children, but they're just being prevented, so they need to be, you know, given these incentives. And that's the way to solve the problems of Europe and not by migration. And again, this harks back to, um, we have another audience member who's done research on those demographic uh, um, discourses and politics um, in 1990s Serbia. Um, so it harks back to these kind of uh, policies as well as discourses around um, the nation and the purity of the nation. And we also have this link to terrorism. Um, this is from a trial of a, a Syrian named Ahmed Hamid, who had come to help his, his parents go through the border um, and ended up getting caught in that, that uh, melee on September the 15th. He took a megaphone because he spoke English. Um, he probably threw a couple of stones and he ended up in, um, in jail. One of the things that he was they, they, they constantly, they were trying to prove that he was a terrorist by proving that he was religious, that he had gone on the Hajj. This was uh, used as evidence that he's a terrorist. Um, and he was also asked to prove that he respected women. Um, and they tried to bring his Greek Cypriot wife there to show them that, look, he, she's not veiled and she's there. And um, so this was also a, a big part of this um, you know, proof of terrorism. 
And then we have, you know, probably an extreme case of this village on the Hungarian border, um, Ashotalom, which um, whose mayor has made a big deal of um, protecting the border. Um, there's a really nice kind of low-budget video that they did of 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 them. You know, riding up and down the border and protecting, and, and, and um, it ends with this scene of very sort of um, defiant stance that, you know, Hungary is a bad choice, Ashatalom is the worst choice, I think is what they say at the end. But then they helpfully provide a Google Maps for how you can go through, through uh, Croatia and Slovenia to get to where you want to go, but don't come to Hungary, right? Um, this was during the, the time, and they've organized um, groups to harass and beat and push, push migrants back through the border. Um, but they've also, the mayor has passed laws banning Muslims, so they banned mosques, um, Islamic structures, they banned burqas, but also while they were at it, they banned gay people, um, which is a, is a strange kind of um, mixture. But it just points to kind of um, this strategy of trying to, to argue that we are actually um, the true Europeans. We have not lost sight of European values, right? And they even made a call to white Europeans to come and live in Ashat Halom as a kind of Muslim-free white oasis um, when they get overwhelmed by all of those uh, migrants in Western Europe. Okay. Um, but not to then, you know, just take these really obvious um, right-wing um, discourses. What I want to say is that, that, these, that these gendered assumptions about migrants um, and the relationship to war and to nation um, are also at work in pro-migration discourses and those uh, people who want to um, uh, argue for solidarity with migrants, for aid to migrants. Um, but here, it's, it becomes very important to show women and children, to show men who are connected to families um, and, when, and who are, who are um, obviously taking on care, caregiver roles, their fathers, they're concerned for their children, um, they show emotion, but they have to be shown with families, with uh, women and children. You, hardly ever see um, pictures of women traveling alone um, or by themselves, uh, even in groups. Um, or you might, as a way of, of showing that, look, they are legitimate asylum seekers. Why would they flee? Um, why would they put their, their families in this uh, position? Um, but again, the, the gendered assumptions are, are sort of left unsaid. And then I just wanted to bring in these. Um, it's uh, I heard a nice paper of, uh, that that brought in one of these images um, earlier in the week at the EU. Um, but here are two images: one from Ser a Serbian police policeman and one from a Croatian policeman. Um, in this is a kind of a competition of goodness uh, here, you know, trying to be better than Hungary at least, or to show Europe that look, um, we do uh, that the, the state cares. We're not um, uh, hostile. We're not racist. Um, of course, the assumption was that these people are moving on; they're not going to stay, right? Um, but this this uh, show of care from. A, a male police officer as the, the, the face of the state towards um, refugee children. Um, you can see it's, it's used in both cases to show the world something. Um, it would have been different with a, a female uh, a police officer. Um, and again, uh, so back to your paper the other day uh, that Serbia is trying to, to um, to recover its image in the world after all of this bad press, right? And look, showing that, look, we, we can be good. But of course, um, there are, there's another side to, um, to, to this uh, with raids on, on migrants and migrant spaces, um, deportations and stories of, of 
not quite uh, the best um, conditions. Uh, this is, of course, not official um, uh, official conditions that are, are set out by the state. Um, but in in um, in several instances, single men have been barred from getting aid. It's only families who are who are welcome in in aid um, spaces. Um, and here's an example of the restrictions on movement that, uh, to prevent the mixing with the local population after an alleged attack on a, on a local woman. Um, and again, you have um, the return of this idea of needing to protect our women from, from these um, defend, uh, invaders. And even the return of this trope of the, the, you know, protecting Europe as we did in the time of the Turks. Um, so this you could see more in um, the Croatian social media spaces uh, that you know we've defended Europe from the Turks before and we'll do it again. Not the Turks, but Muslims. Um, okay, so this is um, just kind of bringing all these threads again, uh, threads together again. Um, so we have depictions of Muslim others as sexually deviant, deviant and threats to our women. Um, men being judged against their roles in war. So they were sometimes accused of um, not staying and fighting. Um, they're cowards, obviously, if they're fleeing. Um, but this is in tension with um, the expectations for men of, if you read uh, a lot of the testimonies of, these, of, of the migrants, they say things like, you know, our family didn't have anything to eat anymore, or um, we, you know, there was nothing, um, there were no jobs. They, 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 they have a clear sense that even if they were stuck in Turkey, for example, there's a clear sense that there's a, a, an imperative to fulfill a breadwinner bread role or to be the one person from the family who's designated to, to migrate and then um, try to set things up um, for others to follow or to send money back. Um, so they're, they're, these are two equally sort of um, classically patriarchal roles, right? Um, men's duties in war versus, and as well as men's duty as, as protectors and, and providers, um, but they're really intention um, here. And when you don't uh, allow for any sort of, of decision-making power or agency for a migrant, then the, those are invisible. Um, so again, single men as threats by definition. Um, and again, going back to agency and initiative is seen as being incompatible with deserving victimhood. So this is the, the legitimate asylum seeker position um, in this case. Again, the, the reemergence of the trope of the bulwark of Europe against invading, invading Muslim enemies and um, this ambivalent positioning of the Balkans, of, of uh, Southeast Europe, but also of Central and Eastern Europe, so the post-socialist state, the new accession states of, of the EU, like Hungary, Poland, um, the, the Visegrad countries, as we're calling them now, um, in relation to the core of, of Europe. Um, and going back to that study of Austrian dis discourses, one of the, the, the main things to come out of that is that, that Austria and some you know, other countries in Europe are not acting all that differently from, from Hungary. The rhetoric's different, but the, the fences are there. The controls are set up. Um, but they're still able to portray Hungary, or not that I'm saying that they don't deserve it, but <laughs> um, to portray Hungary as a, a kind of, of, of not living up to European values, not understanding the core of Europe, um, and in these terms, being other. Um, because of that uh, geopolitical positioning. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop. <laughs> and take your questions and comments, because I hope there will be many. <laughs>